Right then. I thought it might be a good idea here at the end of the course to have a lightning fast run through some of the major things that we've learned. My thinking being, now that we know all of the detail and how stuff works behind the scenes, a quick super fast recap might remind us of the bigger picture. But we'll just run through some of the practical stuff yet, and no stopping off to explain the theory like we've been doing in the rest of the course. Ready? Buckle up. Now, if I make it through this module without a typo, I think I'll take the rest of the day off. Anyway, we're on our Ubuntu host here with Docker already installed. A Docker version gives us all the version info we could ever dream of, right? I reckon most of the time we'll be interested in the client and the server versions here, but we can see the version info of just about every other related component. And remember, okay, the client and server are downloaded and installed as a single package. Another useful command is docker info. So among other things, this guy gives us a snapshot view of the number of images and containers on our system. But remember, images here actually means image layers. So on this system, we've got a grand total of nine image layers. Then we can see that we're using the AUFS union file system as our storage driver, and we're using libcontainer as the execution driver. Drag your minds back to earlier in the course. Native here is telling us that it's using libcontainer rather than lxc. Uh, the root directory here, this is kind of a starting point in the local Docker hosts file system for looking at image and container related config data and data files. Oh, and the kernel version here. Obviously, that's the version of the kernel that we're running on our Ubuntu host machine. And all containers on this host will obviously share that kernel. But in the course, we did mention some recommended kernel version minimums. I'd say a minimum of a 3.10 kernel is generally recommended. We can go a bit lower than that, but we're really best off sticking with 3.10 and higher. Docker images. This shows us all of the images that we've got stored locally here on this Docker host. And see how it's only telling us we've got two, but the output earlier said nine? Well, that was nine image layers. And Docker images with the tree option, this gives us a cracking view of all of that layering. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, nine layers in total. We can see that the Ubuntu 1504 base image, this has got one, two, three, four, five layers. And then the IMG image that we built on top of the Ubuntu base image, this has got an additional four layers. So nine in total. And Docker history, this shows us the actual commands that were used when each of these layers was created. So the top four commands here, these are the commands that we put in our Docker file earlier on in the course. Uh, we've got package installation, exposing port 80, and then running Apache with minus D foreground. The commands below were what we used to build the base Ubuntu image. Now we can pull other images and store them locally using Docker pull. And let's pull CoreOS etcd. And off that goes. And we can even see the different image layers that it's pulling here. Okay, Docker images again. And there it is. Oh yeah, tags. Right, see how it looks like we've got two CoreOS etcd images? Well, if we look in the image ID column, we can actually see that they're both just the same image, just with two different tags. And remember as well, we highly recommend specifying tags when we come to build our own images or launch containers. That way, we know exactly what version of an image we're getting. Okay, so far so good. Switching gears to containers, which remember are effectively running instances of images. Well, we've got Docker PS to show us currently running containers. And it's a bit annoying that it's wrapping it over two lines, but not too hard to see that we've got two containers currently running on our system. One of them here is called receiver and the other source. We can see the images that each is based on, what process or app each is running. So one's running bash and the other one Apache. And remember, those are the PID1 processes inside of the containers. And also of interest here, 
we can see that port 80 is marked as exposed in the IMG image that this container is based off. But if we look closely, we should notice that it's not exposed in the running container, because it's not showing a mapping to a host port. Now, Docker PS on its own just shows us running containers. If we slap minus A onto the end, we get to see all containers that have ever run on the system, unless we've explicitly deleted them, right? Remember, containers are persistent. When we stop them, they still exist on the system, just in a stopped state, kind of like virtual machines. And then we can start them back up any time we want. So if we pick this top one here called web, that's currently stopped. We can do a docker start, give its name, which is web, hit return, and it's up and running. And how fast was that? Stick that in your pipe and smoke it, Mr. Virtual Machine. Anyway, docker ps again, and there it is running. Oh, nice. This one does have its exposed port mapped through to the docker host. See the difference here? So TCP port 80 inside of the container is mapped onto the docker host at port 49154. Love that line wrapping. Now then, a great way to build custom images is with a docker file. Remember, it's capital D there at the front or it won't work. Then, inside of the file, here we specify instructions about how to build the image. So this image here is going to be based on an Ubuntu 15.04 base image. Then the run instructions, these let us run commands against our images at build time. So in this particular instance, we're refreshing the apt cache from source, and then we're installing a bunch of packages, ping, traceroute, and Apache. And remember, okay, by putting them all on the same line, or actually against the same run instruction, we only generate a single image layer. If we'd done it differently, let's say we'd gone run apt-get update on one line, and then on another line, run apt-get install IP utils ping, and then another line each for the other two installs, so four run instructions in total, if we'd done it that way, when we come to build from this docker file, we'd be generating four image layers. So be careful about the layout of your docker file in relation to image layers. Generally speaking, less image layers is better. Anyway, we're making it possible to expose port 80 to the wider world, and we're using the entry point instruction to specify the default PID1 process to run whenever containers are launched from this image. And finally, we're passing arguments to entry point via the CMD instruction. Magic. Let's go and build a new image from it. So we go docker build, give it a name, recap feels good, and then we give it a period to tell it to use the docker file in our current directory. And off we go. Ah, now, this one obviously isn't using the build cache. We can actually see it running all of the commands that we specified in the docker file and creating new image layers. Now, this might take a minute or so, so let me just bend space time here. And there we go, all built. This return code, this is the short ID of our new image. And we can see above here that obviously several layers were added to the image. Docker images. There it is. Now if we launch a new container off of that, call it recap2, it's totally fine for the container name and the image name to be the same. And bingo, that's up and running. And I reckon that's enough. Oh, and you know what? Thanks to the magic of video editing, I didn't make a single typo. Anyway, I hope that was useful. Obviously, we've learned a ton in the course, right? A lot of behind the scenes theory and a boatload of time spent on the command line. But hopefully this recapped a bunch of what we've learned and maybe helped burn it a bit deeper into our brains. And I'm sad to say, there's only one short module left in the course. Next up, a quick module where we'll talk about what to do next. So, now that we know all about core Docker technologies and we're comfortable hacking around with Docker, what can we do to build on this? take ourselves to the next level. See you in the next module.